right. In the interest of people's times, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we might have a few, few people trickling in. But thank you for coming. I'm Linda McCree. I'm the director of the Graduate School Writing Center. And along with Cassie Corlett Rivera, um, who's from the Research Commons from the library, we are doing this presentation, uh, which has a name, How to Write a Literature Review and Introduction to Writing and Research at the Graduate Level or in Graduate School. So I'll be talking a little bit about um, writing graduate school in general, focused specifically on the um, genre of the lit review, and then also talk a little bit about um, writing with clarity. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions. This is not meant to be a particularly formal presentation, so please, anytime something's not clear or you have a question, raise your hand. Um, if for some reason we're getting too many questions and, and it's becoming distracting, I might say, wait, let's hold those for later. But I'm going to do about the first half, a little, little more than half, and then um, we'll take a quick break and Kelsey will take over and talk about the research library. Um, I'm going to just really quickly introduce the Graduate School Writing Center. There are some postcards back there. Um, if any of you haven't heard of the Graduate School Writing Center, it is, as the name would suggest, a writing center explicitly for graduate students. Um, it's located here in McKeldin, down on the fifth floor, basically on the one floor and um, exactly diagonally across from where we are now, so 5100B McKeldin. We operate by um, appointment only, and, the, and so you can't just drop in. And part of the reason for that is that um, you can't really just drop in with a graduate school writing paper, right? So you make an appointment in advance, um, you send your paper, whatever you're working on, in advance to the, we call them writing fellows, who are going to read it. They have a chance to read it in advance and then you come in and have a conversation about the paper. We also do things electronically if you're ever traveling or away. Um, we do appointments um, online synchronously and online asynchronously as well, but the bulk, bulk of what we do is face-to-face -face appointments. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that um, as we go along, but I'm gonna just go ahead and get started with the presentation too. Um, so really what you're thinking about, welcome to graduate school, those of you who haven't been here very long and um, Good for you for still being here, for those of you who have been here for a long time, because it's not that easy. Um, just kind of thinking about what you do in graduate school, you're kind of joining this academic conversation at a slightly um, deeper level, right? If you think about the move from undergraduate to graduate, the, the shift really is that you've moved from taking all that knowledge in, um, consuming it in a sense, and really the idea, um, the further along in graduate school you are, um, the more you're expected to be the producer of knowledge. So you start with analysis and synthesis and evaluation, and by the time you're producing a master's thesis and certainly a doctoral dissertation, you're really one, the one producing the knowledge, and it's meant to be uh, production, a contribution to an ongoing academic conversation. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what that means today, um, and here's what we're going to try to accomplish. Um, we're going to think about what's the connection between research and reading um, and writing for graduate school. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the specifics of a lit review and then think about um, the kind of rhetorical choices that are involved in preparing, a, uh, preparing and shaping a literature review. There's some things we're not going to do today in two hours. Um, we really aren't going to focus much on citation issues. So any of you that have questions about like the spe specific way that you do APA, um, we can help with that, but not, that's really not ideal in a big group. Um, we're not going to work much about talk much about the, the important thing of time management, which is incredibly important for writing in graduate school and your work habits. I talk about those in other settings, so if you want to hear more about those, let me know, and I can let you know when we're doing something about that. And this is obviously not very discipline specific. You're from multiple disciplines, um, and so this is really a very general uh, introduction. I'll be using examples from specific disciplines, but this is much more of a general introduction. Um, whenever I talk about graduate writing, I, um, my background is in rhetoric. Sorry, too squeaky. I come from the English department originally, and my background is rhetoric, in rhetoric and composition. And um, I always like to start with this metaphor from a famous American philosopher and rhetorician, Kenneth Burke, um, who's writing in the 20th century. And Burke has this uh, metaphor. Uh, referred to, as you can see here, as the Burke Room Parlor, um, that really he meant as a metaphor for why we have rhetoric at all, why we argue, why we need persuasion, right? Why do we ever need to convince anybody of anything? But I think it's a perfect metaphor for um, graduate school, especially for writing in graduate school. And I'm going to read it to you because no one reads to you in graduate school. Um, imagine that you enter a parlor. You come late. When you arrive, others have long preceded you and they are engaged in a heated discussion, too heated for them to pause and tell you exactly what it is about. 
In fact, the discussion had already begun long before any of them got there, so that no one present is qualified to retrace for you all the steps that had gone before. You listen for a while until you decide that you've caught the tenor of the argument, then you put in your oar. Someone answers, you answer him, another comes to your defense, another aligns himself against you to either the embarrassment or gratification of your opponent, depending on the quality of your ally's assistance. However, the discussion is interminable, the hour grows late, you must depart, and you do depart with this discussion still vigorously in progress. And if that doesn't sound a lot like graduate school, like you come into a room and everybody's talking about something and you have no idea what they're talking about, and it sounds like they all know what they're talking about and you're supposed to know what you're talking about too, but you don't know. Um, if that doesn't sound like graduate school, then you haven't been here long enough yet. Um, but how does this apply to anything? So think about that shift from really what you're doing in the early stage of any kind of research project, the reading part, um, is really kind of captured in this. You listen for a while until you decide you've caught the tenor of the argument, then you dip in your oar. And I think that's a nice encapsulation of what a lit review is, right? You're listening, what is everybody saying, what are the big ideas here, and then how am I going to put in my voice, right? But you have to do a lot of listening before you're ready to say something intelligent and dip in your oar. Uh, so, what do you need to be able to do to write a lit review? Just kind of thinking about that. Um, you need some awareness, I think, of um, the rhetorical and linguistic conventions of relevant text. That's a really big way of saying you need to know how arguments get made and how, how people talk in your discipline, right, in the relevant texts that you're reading. You need critical thinking skills. Probably you brought those with you when you came to graduate school, so that's, uh, that's an easy one to check off. Um, you need the ability to synthesize information from multiple sources with summary and paraphrase. You probably brought that ability with you as well. You need to put it in practice now, but that's, uh, you probably brought that with you. And really a, bit, a lit review really requires is a way to organize, um, to make a, an analysis coherent. And that's often the really challenging part, figuring out. So you can do all the reading, you can write all the summaries, um, you know how to think about them, but it's the pulling them all together that's often the challenge. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how to do that. Um, and the first step, really, if we think back, right, if the first step is kind of reading them all and critically thinking and being able to synthesize the information, obviously the first step is reading. And I would suggest reading actively, right, um, as opposed to we often think that when we're reading we're just taking in the information. When you're reading, especially with an eye to a lit review, um, then you really need to be reading actively, to be thinking about how anything that you're reading is something that you're going to respond to, right? So how are you standing in that parlor, listening to that conversation, getting ready to dip in your oar? Um, so one of the ways to think about building, uh, to reading actively, is to think about a framework for your reading, right? To kind of be a little strategic about how you're reading and think about where does this fit in into anything else, right? So first of all, know why you're reading something. That sounds really obvious, but it's worth kind of thinking about. What's your purpose in reading this? Do you just need to know it? It's a landmark case. You have to know it. It's one of the most important things in your field. Or you're just kind of skimming it to see um, whether this is worthwhile knowing about, or you're really looking at how they do their methods, or this is an important theory. And we really understand what your purpose for reading is. Um, and then other obvious things, know who, the who and the where of the publication, right? Is this someone, is this uh, an author that really matters? Is this someone very important in the field? Is this someone new in the field? Are they voicing something, uh, something brand new? Are they voicing an opinion from kind of outside of your typical field, right? If you're kind of doing interdisciplinary work, what kind of, where is this coming from? Um, and which, what publication is this? Is it a really central publication in your discipline? Is it, again, kind of somewhere on the periphery? Is it starting to do some interdisciplinary work? So starting to think about how does all this start to fit together is an important way to start building a framework. And then you want to think about, obviously, reading what well, you probably already do already, right? Read the abstract and the introduction first. But what are you getting from those, right? As quickly as possible, and I know a well-written abstract and a, a, well, a well-written first few paragraphs should be able to tell you this. What's at issue in this article? And that's a phrase I'll come back to, kind of what's at issue? What are the questions in your field that this is addressing? What are the what problems are they, is it trying to solve? What are the big conversations of your field that it's entering into? What's the context, right? The, the abstract of the introduction should tell you a little bit about that. What's the context? Why is this being written? Where, um, not only the kind of time frame, but also what, where is it fitting into a conversation? Um, how does it fit into the intellectual landscape of your field? Is it contributing to the conversation? Is it fil building a, um, filling a gap, building on, uh, building on research or on theory, entering something new, et cetera? Um, and then also think about what kind of article you're reading. 
and um, and maybe you've kind of figured this out already in your field, but you can you could make all sorts of categories for the kinds of articles that there are, but here are a few that probably appear in most of your disciplines. Is it a data-driven paper, right? Really, it's the result of empirical studies. Is it a methods paper, where it's really about explaining a new method or um, a, app, a new application of a method? Um, is it a theory paper? Is it um, there to kind of set a new agenda or raise consciousness about something? And obviously, if some of, if some of you are like, what, a consciousness raising paper? Like, some of these don't exist, maybe, in your field or they don't come up as frequently in your field as they do in other fields. Um, but they might come up still. Or is it a review paper itself, right? So probably, especially when you're looking at a lit review, you're probably gonna look at first to see if there are other reviews of literature about that question. Is that what this paper, is that the goal of, of whatever you're reading? Um, and then you wanna think about how to read, right? And no one talks about how you read in graduate school, except that you should do it really quickly and you should do a ton of it. Um, but you also need to be a little bit strategic about it, and especially any kind of text that you're going to talk about later on, it's a good way to think about reading it closely and being able to have some, create some kind of notes about it that are going to make sense to you um, and that are going to leave you with a good kind of good first steps towards synthesis, not just, um, you've all I'm sure had the experience of reading something and you know it's important in your field and you use a highlighter, those of you who still read in paper, you take the highlighter, and those of you that do it on PDF, you still can do it with the highlighter, and um, you land up with an entire page of highlighted material. Yes, this has happened to all of us. Um, and then it's like, uh, what do I do with that? Like, that whole page is really important, but I can't just take that whole page and put it in my paper, right? How do I start to process that? So glossing is a way to kind of give you something, a way to process what you're reading, right? Not just to say, this is all incredibly important, but how am I gonna use it? So. Um, Glossing for reading, I also talk about glossing for writing, although I won't talk about that um, here today. It's a pretty simple and straightforward process, um, and it helps you understand the rhetorical conventions and the linguistic conventions of the field, as well as understanding the content, right? So for every paragraph, or you could do this for every section, every page, whatever, whatever kind of chunk you need to, for every paragraph, we'll call it, um, you wanna make yourself a quick gloss, a quick note to the side on a post-it, on a you know, a uh, comment frame in your, on your PDF with your pencil, however it works. Um, a quick note about what the paragraph is saying, kind of sentence long summary, what it's saying, and, a, and also a comment about what's it doing, what's its function within the article. And your goal here is both to understand the substance, the content, but also the structure of what's going on, right? Because one of the things that you need to learn to write in your field is what the structure of your field looks like. Where do arguments happen? What kind of background happens? How do arguments get put together? Um, so glossing really is a kind of interpretive reading strategy. Um, oh, I repeated the basic how-tos twice. That's right, you can use them twice. It's not the same as responding, right? Probably some of you also read and you write notes in the margins saying things like, what an idiot, or that's a great idea, or that really complicates how I thought about X. Um, that's not quite glossing. Glossing is much more like summarizing. So let's try. Here's a paragraph um, from something probably not, none of you have ever had the need to read um, because it's from a law journal, the Georgetown Law Review. Um, and it's the first paragraph of an article on the philosophy of intellectual property. So it's the first paragraph, so you can already think about how it functions. Um, in the century since our founding, the concept of property has changed dramatically in the United States. One repeatedly mentioned change is the trend toward treating new things as property, such as job security and income from social programs. A less frequently discussed trend is that historically recognized, but nonetheless atypical forms of property, such as intellectual property, are becoming increasingly important relative to the old paradigms of property, such as farms, factories, and furnishings. As our attention continues to shift from intangible to intangible forms of property, we can expect a growing jurisprudence of intellectual property. So if you were to do a quick gloss, summarizing that paragraph, what would be in your gloss? I'm gonna ask you to actually take a minute and jot down some notes or try to formulate the sentence in your head or just try it. A sentence saying what is it, a summary of its content, and then a sentence that summarizes what this paragraph is doing, what's its function in the article.
victims. Anybody want to try and summarize the content of the paragraph? Lost the content. Right, the, the content of the, sorry, what was your word? The concept, the concept of property has changed from farms, can't say it without, but farms, factories, and furnishings to intellectual property. Anybody have something different? Because everybody had something kind of like that, I suspect, right? I did too. Oops, whoops, I gave you both of them. All right, well, sorry. Historically, what we've considered property has changed and intellectual property is becoming increasingly important, right? So again, putting it in your own words. And then I, I gave you that. I didn't have them animated to come up one at a time, right? Obviously, the paragraph is the introduction. That's how it's functioning. But what is it doing as the introduction, right? It's kind of establishing why the argument matters, right? Why do we have to start being concerned about intellectual property? And that's it. And you can see the benefit here, right? When you go to write a summary later, if you have 20 of those boxes, that's you can get to a summary much faster than if you have six pages of underlined uh, or highlighted material. Even if you had, you know, only 20 sentences of um, highlighted material, you're still spending the time doing the, the kind of analysis, right, putting it in your own words as opposed to just highlighting that it's important. So glossing is a way to make sure that you're understanding it um, and also a way to start seeing how the arguments get established, how, um, how discourse moves in your field. Questions about that? Uh -huh. I said I'd also mention it for writing later. So this is actually also, this is for reading, but it's a great tactic to use on your own writing when you have a draft and you have a draft and you're like, I don't know what to do with this next. How do I revise it? It's also called reverse outlining. So you look at your draft and you kind of gloss your own draft. Like, here's my main point. Here's my main point again. Here's my main point again. Hmm, right? That's a good clue that the, the structure maybe isn't what you wanted. So um, good, for, uh, a good, good for consuming what you, um, what you read, but also for analyzing what you've produced. Um, all right, let's... Think a little bit more specifically, now that you've done all that reading, we've, we've covered reading in 20 minutes, um, what are you actually doing in a lit review? So what is a lit review? Um, and where does a good literature review begin? And I've already given you a hint that this is a trick question. So this is one of those, guess what the teacher is thinking, questions. But where does a good lit review begin? Any ideas? A definition of the idea that you're reviewing, okay, that you need to, that it needs to actually start with that um, concept. That's a great, that's a great point. Um, and it, it comes up, it brings up something I'm going to talk about later too. What else? Okay, who are the people out there that are doing what you want to do, right? So who are the important names? So kind of establishing that. Who's, who, who are the people that are saying important things, okay? Any, anything else? It starts with the general idea about your subject. Okay, so kind of knowing what kinds of important questions your subject is after. Anything else? Any other nominations? Those are all right, and so is mine, which is different. Which is it starts with a research question, right? So. Um, so specifically, when you get to do a literature review for your master's thesis or for your dissertation, or even when you're doing the kind of you know um, three paragraphs of lit review for a seminar paper, right? You should be driven by what is it that I'm trying to ask, too, right? So of course it fits into what are the questions in my field, what am I, fi what it's fitting into, and then obviously you're starting with what is this thing that I'm talking about, right? That kind of definitional question. Um, but it's also about what am I trying to answer, right? Where am I? You start with your here's the big question I want to answer. Who else is looking at the, that question? What other, how else is that question being asked? How else is it being answered, right? So thinking about, it starts with a question, um, just like any other research project. Um, and, oh, that was mine. Get it, you're dipping in your oar. There's my image. Um, and the other way to think about this is that um, a lit review is evidence that you're a scholar before you're a researcher. And for some of your fields, that may not seem right, right? Those of you that are doing very applied fields, um, where you're in labs and you're doing your own research. No, you feel like you're a researcher first, but of course you're still entering into that parlor of discussion and need to know what's happened beforehand. And 
Um, and in the lit review, you're just kind of explaining what's happened beforehand too, right? So it's that lit review is being showing that you've been a scholar before you were a researcher, right? A lit review also helps you discover and move toward filling some gap in the research. That's probably a, a concept that you've heard of before, right? Any of your research is always answering a question like, what's the gap? What's missing? How do I, um, how do I um, find, fill a gap? Sometimes it's how do I create a gap that I can then fill, right? Um, the other thing that you're doing in a literature review is establishing your credibility, right? Who am I to say that any of this matters? Um, who am I to answer a question? You first have to kind of prove that you have the credibility, that you know what other people have said, so you can step in and, and start to be part of that conversation as well. So you're the credible salt. That didn't get the laugh at all. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Another way to think about this, and for some of you, um, this will be more familiar territory. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Bloom's taxonomy, and any of you that are in education, I'm sure have. Um, Bloom was an um, education researcher from the 50s, and there, this, there are multiple versions and revised. This is a revised version of um, understanding how, how knowledge builds, right? First you have to know things, and then in the end you create things. And then the type there is a little bit small. I don't know about pointed. Oh, it's just uh, there it is, um, right? So really, you're, if you think about it, you're at a, a lit review is kind of at the analysis stage, right? So you're here, can, can the student distinguish between different parts? Can you appraise, compare, contrast, criticize, differentiate, discriminate, distinguish, examine, experiment, question, and test, right? You're kind of right there in a lit review. Before you get to, you're doing a little bit of evaluating too, but before you get to creating your own point, you're kind of in that analysis. You have to do all the knowing and understanding um, before you get to uh, before you get to the making your own part. So you're kind of in the analysis piece. So if that's if that's a helpful way to think about a lit review, um, there it is. Uh, what else? A little bit more. In generic terms, a good lit review synthesizes previously published knowledge about an issue or a practice. Right? It says what's come before you. Um, it's there to help your reader. Right? Why are you doing this? Often it feels like an exercise. Right? Certainly um, in a in a uh, um, in a dissertation, it probably really feels like an exercise, like you just have to show that you are that scholar before you can be a researcher. But if you think about any lit review, uh, yeah, reviews that you've read in published material, they're there to help the reader. Um, they're there to say, okay, reader, you don't have time to know all of this. I've done that heavy work, and I'm giving you a synthesis. Right? That's, that may seem more or less true in your field. This is, um, it's easy to think about this in, in medicine. You see a ton of um, lit reviews. In, in, um, in the medical field, right? All, this is all the stuff that's happening. You don't have time. Active doctors don't have time to know all this, so I'm doing all this so that you can just read the review and you can get the main ideas. I've done all the synthesis work, um, and that's the way they're supposed to work for any, any discipline. Um, they establish the ground for existing knowledge to be extended, and they're supposed to lead the reader through a kind of narrative of what's passed, here's what's been done, in order to clear a space for future argument. And there's that idea that it's a narrative um, comes up repeatedly, right? That, that a lit review is a narrative. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So that's what they are. What can go wrong when you do a lit review? Anybody tried one and know all the pitfalls? I see a few smiles. What can go wrong? Or what's hard? Nothing, they're easy. That's why you came in on a beautiful fall afternoon. Go ahead. Knowing where to stop, right? This is the question I get all the time. Where do I stop, right? And that's a question that I can't answer for you, right? That's really, that's in part one of the hardest questions. That's a question that you have to decide with your advisor, right? How far back do you need to go? When do you, um, when do you really have a good sense of the field? Um, what else? What are the other challenges? What else makes them hard? Or what can go wrong? How to organize them is definitely the big challenge. That's on the other hand. Staying on track, right? Because it's easy to kind of go off in, in different directions, right? So the being able to really do that synthesis. Anything else? I think I have all those and some more. Um, it's not systematic or comprehensive enough, right? Um, it may focus on the wrong sources, so you don't know if you've pulled in the right things. It can seem to lack a sense of purpose, right? Goes off on the wrong track. Um, feels like it's a collection of things without ever really being a clear sense of synthesis. What I see professors saying when I 
Um, the first time I did this, I did a ton of reading about what, what are the problems of graduate students writing lit reviews. And the number one problem that professors complained about was they're just annotated bibliographies. They're just a list of sources, and that's not what they need to be. They need to be doing that synthesis. They need to be doing that heavy lifting of synthesis. Um, but wait, there's more that can go wrong, right? Um, you can assume that you're too, too much familiarity with the sources, right? That's a kind of um, delicate balance. Are you, uh, um, are, if you're only talking about texts that everybody else has talked, uh, knows about, then why are you talking about them? You're being too familiar in your discussion. And often when they're very close to you, when you've read them at a lot of times, right, it's easy to feel too familiar with them and not represent them to your reader effectively enough. Um, maybe for some, you're failing to distinguish what's fact from what's opinion in some field, um, too many generalizations, uh, poor organizations, which then makes the reader's job um, problematic. But wait, there's more. Um, I think the biggest one, they can be really boring and formulaic, right? Part of the reason that they're challenging to write is that it very much sometimes I think feels like an exercise, right? That you just kind of have to slog through this and do it. It's just a step in an exercise. Um, that uh, people don't say, wow, that was the most fascinating lit review I've ever read in my life. Um, they have to follow some kind of formula, and so it's harder to make them a little more exciting. But they can be, because in many ways, they're very much a narrative, right? It's just kind of a manner of thinking about a narrative in the right way. They're a research narrative. They're telling a certain kind of story. Now, I have to caution by saying that doesn't mean that they should be presented in the way that you found them, right? So they're not the kind of journey that you took. Like, first I read this, and then 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 I read this. That's the journey of your reading, and it's not necessarily the synthesis that's going to be useful for your um, audience, for your readers. Um, so they're a narrative, but be careful what kind of narrative. Narratives have settings, right? So they, your lit review should have some kind of context to it. How, what's the context that it's fitting into? What's that research question that it's answering? has characters, obviously the, the kind of big names in the field, the kind of movements in the field, things like that. Um, has actions, what's changed, what's developed across the field, across time. Um, a narrative leads audiences where you, the author, want them to go, right? A good lit review is positioning um, the, the, the story of the research so for your readers so that they can see that the next step that you're taking, which is whatever new research you're um, uh, generating is necessary, right? So you're leading them to the point where they say, aha, of course, that's the step that needs to happen next. So you're leading them through with some room for their own adventures, right? You're also kind of leading them to think, ah, there's other things maybe that need to happen here as well. Um, and then who are you? You're the talented scholar who can engage the fierce article to tame them, to make them reveal their burning questions. That, that sounds very tongue in cheek, but in a sense, that's really right. You're there to kind of be the one who pulls everything together tames things and makes things um, kind of show what they're, why they're important. Um, they're a narrative in another way, too. A good lit review is an argument, right? It's answering a question, and that's an argument, or should be. Uh, it's not just a list of summaries. It should be persuasive, right? You're communicating to your readers that the, that the, um, the research, the background that you're explaining, has some kind of story. Um, and that you're highlighting the important things to your work, right? Here are the important highlights that precede your work. One more, I think about why it's a narrative, kind of thinking about um, a comparison, because I hear this all the time, professors say, well, my students need to learn that their writing needs to be a narrative. Science is a narrative, sociology is a narrative, everything's a narrative. What does that mean, though, right? When your concept of a narrative comes from fiction, what does that mean? So, so there's a nice a kind of parallel, right? So here are the kind of elements of a, a narrative from fiction, from stories, right? And there are your narratives on the side for a lit review, right? You're offering your readers a kind of unfolding of discovery, just like uh, a, a kind of classical journey or quest, right? In most research, there are some obstacles that have to be overcome, um, and that makes for a kind of plot. And there's arrangement in a narrative, right? You're arranging those obstacles or those moments in history, those moments of context in a way that makes sense. Um, and, and in, in uh, fiction, we look for that arrangement to have some kind of narrative tension, right? Here are the things that need to unfold, what's going to happen next. So some other ways to think about um, lit reviews as a little bit more than a narr uh, annotated bibliography. Um, and then questions, what should my lit review do? My guess is that these are some of the questions you have. Um, you'll probably have others as well, and you can tell me what they are. Should your narrative, should your lit review rather focus only on very recent publications? Yes? No? 
should your narrative, should your lit review um, uh, ignore anything that's not in your immediate discipline, right? You only need to look in your immediate discipline. Should it be organized chronologically and kind of uh, um, develop chronologically what the most important texts through time? Um, should it begin with some kind of historical overview of the field? All of that really depends, right? So oh, those are questions that are important to ask. They're not questions that I can answer generically for everyone's lit review, right? But those are kind of um, rhetorical questions and contextual questions that you have to answer. Um, why would you only focus on very recent publications in your lit review? Why would you ignore something from, say, 1990? Right, because the research has changed. Right? Depending on your field, you don't care about things that happened that far back, right? Things are built on things and you don't need to look that far back for anything. Why, on the other hand, would you look at something from, say, 1985 in your lit review? Right, because you do want to say the context goes back that far. Right? You're kind of um, offering a different kind of context, right? Um, many of you will ignore work that's not in your immediate discipline, right? But those of you who are doing anything that's even vaguely interdisciplinary may need to look beyond your immediate discipline, right? Um, should you organize chronologically? Again, that really depends. What um, Are you telling a story about a certain development through time, or is that not the way that you need to be addressing this? Um, and do you need to begin with some kind of historical overview of your field? Maybe, depending on the kind of question that you're asking, right? So those are some of the questions that you'll want to ask, and, um, and I can't answer them easily, but those are important ones for you to think about. Um, there are a few different types of lit reviews. Um, and here's, this is a quote, this is from a um, criminal justice. I don't think any of you are in criminal justice, but, um, but I think many of these uh, categories still work for many of your fields, not all of them. Generally speaking, lit reviews will have one of three types of focus, focuses. They may be integrative, right, summarizing past research based on overall conclusions of past research. They may be more theoretical, identifying and critiquing the ability of different theories to explain a phenomenon, or they may be more methodological, highlighting different methods uh, different methodological, methodological approaches used in past research and the contributions of each type of research and focus. They may also be narrative. You often hear of narrative lit reviews that really do kind of tell the story of a, a kind of question or a kind of approach. So different ways to cut up the category. Questions so far? Jump into the next big issue then, which is the organizing, right? So once you've done the reading and you start thinking about what are the big questions, what are the big questions, how am I addressing this, how am I starting to pull things together, then you finally do have to do the organizing. And I like this image, right, because there's all sorts of ways to organize those little play things, right? We could organize them by size, you can organize them by color, you could organize them by whether or not they have a hole in them, you can organize them by um, size and color and whether or not they have a hole, right? Um, category, subcategory, subheading. Um, all sorts of ways to organize things. And there's, that's usually what happens for a lit review, right? There's not just one way to organize it. So do you organize by a theoretical framework, by sample size and number of cases, by the kind of application stress, by types of studies, by the source of a study, by discipline, by chronology, by issue or aspect? Again, no one answer. For some fields, the answers will be more obvious than for others, um, but but you want to have some way of, of organizing things, right? Some organizing principle, and those are some ways that you might think about it. Putting that all together, probably a good idea to make yourself some kind of spreadsheet-like thing, even if you're in the humanities like me, and a spreadsheet feels like the most foreign thing in the universe, right? Some way to think or um, in some organized fashion or try to um, kind of keep things maintained in a list and be able to see uh, and compare things, right? So whether it's by study and then your categories across the top matrix are whatever they are, right? Year, theory, sample size, model, I mean, that's a, a kind of um, social science approach, um, but all sorts of other potential questions across the top, like purpose of study, method, um, all sorts of ways to analyze that or to organize that, rather. Um, other things about organizing, you might think about identifying studies and each, stu each study then in turn may consist of many findings. Think about categories of uh, the findings of those studies. You might think about recognizing threats to the validities of studies. So all kinds of questions about organizing. Um, if something like that rigid doesn't work for you, something like that may work better at right? a kind of mind map. And you can easily, if you haven't already discovered this, you can easily um, 
search online for a, a mind map that you can fill in, and you do that, right? So, you know, your big ideas, and then which ideas spring from those, and helping you color code them, have things branching off of other things. So if that works better for your method, that's a kind of organization too. Looks very different than the, than the um, spreadsheet version, but it's also a kind of organization. Um, and then I'm gonna suggest a different kind that I think fits in with both of those uh, ways of organizing. And that's something that again comes from rhetorical theory um, and, and it's um, stasis theory. And it's probably something you've never heard of and yet you actually have heard of, that you do all the time. So stasis theory, as I said, comes from rhetorical theory and the idea is asking what is at issue in something and where do we have some kind of disagreement. So stasis is where we can't move anymore, right? Things are at stasis, we can't, we, our argument, our agreement can't go forward. We can't agree because we, we're kind of stuck at a point where we don't, uh, where we can't, we can't find common ground anymore. Um, comes from legal theory originally and if you think about, um, there had to be a very organized way to understand in any kind of court situation, or any kind of legal case, um, what was at issue at any point. And if you think about a law case, you have to decide something before you move on to something else. So you don't start with, um, I have a dead body, you're going to jail, right? There's all sorts of steps in between. Like, how do we go from discovering a dead body to putting someone in jail? What kinds of things have to happen? We investigate. Right, exactly right. We first think about what exactly happened here. How did this person die? Was there someone to blame or not? Was it natural causes? Was it something else? What else? You watch Law and Order. I know that. Evidence that it looks at what? What kind of, what are we looking for from evidence? Okay, that something happened, right? Okay, and then what else? possible that we find that in fact someone did it and they still don't go to jail. Why? Hmm? Self, right, there are some kind of mitigating factors, right? It was self-defense, it was really an accident, it was, um, it was uh, reasonable homicide, I don't know, whatever, I'm not a lawyer, obviously, right? So all those, there's all sorts of steps and at any one point, things change, right? So if we find this body and we decide it was uh, murder, one set of things happens, one set of things happens. If we find this body and we decide it was natural causes, a very different set of things happens, right? Um, so stasis theory helps us understand those. And so here they are, it's a series of questions. Um, they exist in, a, in an order, not in a hierarchy necessarily, but in order. And you'll probably see that some of your field, that all of your fields ask some of these questions, and some of your fields care about some of these questions more than others, right? So we first of all have to understand, have to have agreement about issues of fact. What happened? What exists? Um, does a problem exist? What happened? What causes it? What's out there, right? Um, and then we think about questions of definition. Well, okay, it exists, then we think about what to call it, right? So the dead body existed. What caused it? Then we decide, well, we call it murder, we call it suicide, we call it natural causes, et cetera. So how do we define this thing? Um, and then we think about how good or bad something is. Well, how bad was that? How, you know, how do we judge its impact? And then finally, we think about questions of action. Okay, well, we agree with all those kinds of things. We agree it was, we agree what happened, we agree what to call it, we agree it was bad, then we can think about what do we do about that? And we can certainly have disagreements about what do we do about that. So those exist in a kind of hierarchy, or rather a kind of order, I should say. And then there's also the questions that, um, about who, who gets to decide at any point. And those kind of exist outside of any kind of order, right? At any point, we could say, who gets to decide what this is? Who gets to decide what we do about it? Who gets to decide what we call it? Um, if I say Pluto, right, what's Pluto? When you were a child, Pluto was a planet, yes? And now it's not. How did that happen? How did that happen? Why is Pluto no longer a planet? Does anybody know, remember this? It's only that long ago. It is right, kind of the, the it, so Pluto has continued to exist, right? Nothing about its existence changed. Um, but something about its categorization changed, right? So we started calling it something else. Um, and then that led to different actions, right? We started categorizing it differently. So it's now we, 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 uh, we don't teach that it's a planet, et cetera, et cetera. And along the way, there was a question of, well, who got to decide? Who got to decide? And I think now maybe Pluto is a planet again or something like that because kids said, no, we want Pluto to be something like that, right? So that question of who gets to decide at any point. 
So I'm going to stop that. Um, actually, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to get one more. So there's, because this is rhetorical theory, um, and it's a theory, not anything else, um, and, and rhetoric always seeks to describe what's happening rather than be prescriptive. So there's an kind of alternate theory, and that's this version of stasis, um, also with questions about jurisdiction. And you can see that for some, the question of fact and then definition, and then we start thinking about causes. So that's that's the kind of big difference. Is is the que are the questions of cause way up the, right up there with the questions of existence, or do they come later? Can we agree that there's an existence of something without agreeing on the cause? Those I think work differently for different fields, and again, it's a descriptive. Um, it's it's value is to describe, not to prescribe. So, but I'll leave those there for a minute. I want to ask you, what are the what are the most important questions in your discipline, and what category are they? In? Does your discipline really focus on questions of action? Or is it stick with questions of existence? Or the questions of existence get resolved really quickly and you're really concerned about questions of definition or questions of value? I can think first, right? So English, we care a little bit about questions of existence, right? When people discover new texts, but we're often large. We, make arguments about definitions, right? What counts as a sonnet? What counts as a poem? What counts as a, um, when does something become a play? What's the comparison between a, a film? I just heard an argument this morning about, or yesterday, about um, um, Shakespeare maybe being more like a movie script than a modern play, right? So that which category does something fit into? We argue a lot about questions of value. How good is something? And sometimes about questions of action. But most of those questions of action are about what goes into a canon, what should get taught, What's an important text? All right, your turn. What is your field do? What kinds of questions? What's your field, first of all? OK. OK. All right. OK. So lots of questions about definition, and then kind of questions of cause, too, right? What, how does it work? How does it operate? OK. Anybody else? What kinds of questions predominate your field? Anybody see that their field does all of them? What field do you in? I can guess. I was going to say, you must be in education. Why? Explain why it works through all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. Right, and probably any of you are in policy, the same kinds of, we could say the same thing with slightly different words, right? All, all the time you're thinking about what's the problem that exists, how do we categorize it, what's causing it, um, how, how much does it matter, how good or how bad it is, and what are we going to do about it? Right? So for some fields, we do. You do like look through all those. Now there might be more greater arguments at some stasis than at others, right? So that a problem exists, maybe you don't need to spend a lot of time making, you know, um, creating agreement about that, right? There's easy agreement that a problem exists, and maybe most of your disagreement is about well, what exactly should we do about it? Other fields, you probably never really get into questions of action. Anybody in physics? No. Then I could just talk about it as if I know something, right? So um, theoretical physics doesn't really care much about questions of action, right? Until it's questions of how are we going to get the money to study these questions, right? They're largely about what exists out there, right? What is happening? What's causing something? Not too, maybe not too concerned about questions of value, right? Um, so different fields are um, predominantly looking at different questions. Anybody else want to try? What's your what kinds of questions your field looks at? No, that's okay. That's all right. So there, those are good questions to be able to understand, and I'll explain why I'm using them in a second. So stasis could be a good way to help you organize a lit review, right? Thinking about, well, what's the problem? What kinds of problems are out there? How has it been addressed? How has it been defined? Where are there kinds of disagreements about issues of definition? Um, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so there's my um, grid for stasis theory. And I'll show you how this works, in fact. This is, you probably can't see this very well. This is from a clinical um, psychology journal, right? Recent advances in developmental and risk factor research on eating disorders. And, um, and 
the keywords tell us something about the fields, right? Eating disorders, risk factors, development, anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder. And the title tells us, right, it's asking something about what's new, right? What's, um, what's new, recent advances, what's happening, what exists out there. And then in developmental and risk factor research, what causes, right? Those are the stasis that it's, um, theses that it's addressing right away in the title. Um, and then here's the abstract. I'm gonna show you how kind of the abstract itself goes through the steps of, um, of the stasis, right? So the opening sentence, and, and of course the abstract represents the article as a whole, right? Um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5, currently recognizes three primary eating disorders, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorders. These exist, right? They're not arguing about that, right? There's no argument that these things exist, right? They exist. They're stating that case and moving on. Um, the origins of eating disorders are complex and remain poorly understood. Ah, they exist, but we don't really know why, right? So their cause is definitely at issue. Uh, however, emerging research highlights a dimensional approach to understanding the multifactorial etiology of eating disorders as a means to inform assessment, prevention, and treatment efforts. New research is helping us understand their causes, right? And we can start to assess, prevent, treat. In other words, we can look at their causes. We can think about how important they are, right? What kind of value to assign to any of those, right? Assessment, prevention, and then treatment, right? Um, prevention and treatment, those are questions of action. Um, this is the long part, right? Guided by research published since 2011, this research summarizes recent findings elucidating risk factors for the development of eating disorders across the lifespan of three primary domains, genetic, biological, psychological, and socio-environmental. Prospective empirical research in clinical samples with full syndrome eating disorders is emphasized with added support from cross-sectional studies where relevant. The developmental stages of puberty and the transition from adolescence to young adulthood are discussed as crucial periods for the identification and prevention of eating disorders. We're gonna look at risk factors. Most of this article looks at causes, right? Most of this is about causes. And then their conclusion, the importance of continuing to elucidate the mechanisms underlying gene by environmental interaction and eating disorders is also discussed. So we're going to consider causes, but there's also some underlying question of what's really important, right? How do they matter? And so we can see that they, they're not, they didn't quite get to questions of action, a little bit, but not too much, right? They're, this article is largely focused on looking at causes, but they start with, here's what exists, um, in the article itself, it actually offers some definitions of all those eating disorders. It doesn't show up in the abstract, but the article did. So they, this is what exists. Here's what we call everything. And then let's think about the causes. Oh, I, oops, and there's the final about action. Finally, controversial topic from this eating. You can do it. All right. Um, so thinking about using stasis theory for organization, right? Thinking about what exists out there. Is there some dispute about what exists? What terms are important? Are any terms being disputed, right? So the idea of we start with defining what that thing that we're studying, right? What, how do we, is there any disagreement about this term that we're using? Um, are there, are the causes at issue? Are the effects at issue? Um, is, you know, is, are, what's good and bad, beneficial or not, important or not in this issue? And then how do we resolve this issue? What are we doing about it? What policy can be put in place? So those are the kinds of questions that you may be asking in your lit review. You may only be asking some of those, right? You may just be looking at um, definitions, um, existence and definitions. You may be mostly focusing on causes, but thinking in that order can help um, uh, help too. And again, this is, this is very kind of the way the Western mind categorizes things, right? Again, it's, that's a descriptive system. Um, I'm gonna skip this example. Not because talking about toxicology is All right, so how do you start a lit review? So we've gone through thinking about doing the reading, thinking about pulling together the synthesis, thinking about organizing it, but where, did you, where do you think about actually starting, right? So the rhetorical situation, which is the situation that you're arguing into, right? Um, think about the, that as the context of the rhetorical event, right? So the rhetorical situation is where is my argument? What do I need to think about to make this argument? What's at issue? Who's my audience? Um, and then this set of constraints, right, which is a fancy way of saying, what's my purpose? Um, what's the genre that this is going into? Where's my exigence? And I'll come back to that in a second, right? So is your, so whether your lit review is an entire chapter of your dissertation or four paragraphs of your seminar paper or a quick, um, or a, a final slide or a, fine, a, corner, um, a, a corner frame on your poster presentation, right? Those are different kinds of constraints that are gonna shape the way it, um, it's articulated. Um, so think about who's your audience, first of all. Um, who is this, whoops, who is it for? Sorry, I got ahead of myself. 
Who's it for? Why are they reading it? Are the same things that you were asking yourself about, well, who, what am I, um, what am I doing, reading this for? Why is your audience reading it? The same kind of questions. I got ahead of myself. Um, thinking about what are the constraints? How much space and time do I have to do this? What do people already know? Um, what can and can't be discussed in the amount of time or space that I have? Those are important constraints. And then this question of exigence. Why am I doing this? So exigence, if that's a, not a term that's familiar, exigence is a concept that explains why does this matter and why does it matter now, right? It's a kind of sense of creating a need for what follows, right? Something being exigent. You've created a sense that it's important at a particular time. Um, Lloyd Bitzer is a, another 20th century rhetorician who, who said that exigence we could explain by it's an imperfection marked by an urgency, right? So it's a gap that needs to be filled. And often we have to create that sense of urgency as academics, right? Why is something all that important? Why is it important? It may be very important to your audience. It may not be very important to your audience. Um, and you need to create that sense of urgency. So thinking about how you're um, how you shape the exigence, the reason you're giving people to read this, the reason that it's important is, is part of your argumentation and is really the beginning of your argumentation, right? It's where you start. Um, and then after kind of it's, um, establishing why someone's going to care enough to read it, why it matters, why people want to pick it up, then you're spending some time thinking about what's the background here? What, how much background do I have to give my audience, give my readers to know things? Um, you might think about this as the statement of the case. If I go back to kind of thinking about legal discourse, right? And again, I know you watch Law and Order. Um, how much? What do you have to do in your opening? Uh, in your opening, your opening statement, right? What What do you give about the background of the case, right? What's the story of this issue? How are you contextualizing? How broadly do you want to contextualize it? Um, who really cares, right? What disciplines matter here? Who cares, right? Which scholars? Which publics? So you're really kind of thinking about how you frame your issue, how broadly, um, how narrowly you're framing it, um, how you're telling that story. And I'm going to look at an example here. And this is an example from business. The employment, and this is a review article, the employment interview, a review of current studies and directions for future research. So about doing an employment interview, something you've probably all had to do at some point. So how are they, how is this author kind of creating that sense of exigence? Why th does this matter? And then also establishing the background. Um, so here's the opening paragraph. Employment interviews are a popular selection technique from many viewpoints. In organizations around the world, employment interviews continue to be one of the most frequently used methods to assess candidates for employment. Here's a string of citations. Among organizational decision makers, interviews have been found to be the assessment method most preferred by supervisors and human resources practitioners. Moreover, applicants perceive interviews as fair as compared to other selection procedures and applicants expect interviews as part of a selection process. In fact, from an applicant's perspective, obtaining a job interview is fundamental to job search success. How has Professor Mackin created a sense of exigence here? Even if you don't care about this, how has she created a sense that maybe you should care about this? Because I'm guessing you're not, a, most of you are not readers of human resource management review. And yet, how has she created a sense of exigence? Right, clear sense of stakeholders. I think I have them highlighted. Oops, no, I don't have them highlighted. Right, a clear sense of who cares about these things, right? Um, and, and the breadth, right? Candidates care, decision makers care, human resource practitioners care, applicants care so much that without an interview, they feel like the job, you know, the job interview, the job search process hasn't even happened, right? So she's saying, here's the broad sense of things, right? So who cares is what she's saying, right? Lots of people care, therefore it's a question worth looking at. Um, this is the next paragraph, I think. Um, the employment interview has also been a popular topic among researchers for almost 100 years and is still garnering considerable research interest. Notably, numerous meta-analyses have revealed that structured interviews can display relatively high levels of validity without the adverse impact typically found with cognitive ability tests. Um, while we have learned much about the employment interview, current research activity suggests that more remains to be uncovered. In the last six years since Hostuma, Morganson, and Campion's comprehensive review of the employment interview literature. Over 100 new articles have appeared in journals and books examining the interview. So what's she doing here to set up the context, right? She's saying, giving a certain breadth, right? 
we've been doing interviews for over a hundred years, right? And or rather, researchers have been um, caring about how they do that, how we do re how we do employment interviews for over a hundred years, right? So it has a long history. Um, she notes there was this review rather recently, right? 202. I think this article was was only uh, 2008, right? So there's already been so much more about this, right? Obviously, this is something that people care a lot about. And she she kind of stretches the um, background back, right? For 100 years, people have cared, and then narrowly focuses it. And yet, since 2002, there have been all this, there's been 100 new articles, so we should continue to care about it. So there's that sense of how she establishes the background. Um, oh, there are my highlights. I didn't have them in order, right? I'll put it over there. Um, Right. One last thing before we start thinking about how you actually do the research that gets you to the writing, and that's um, once you've done the reading, figured out how to pull it all together, started to create your back, your egg, created exigence, created a background, then you actually have to write it. That's the fun part, right? Um, and so thinking about how you help your reader follow through things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some just general guidelines for uh, clarity in your writing. And I'm going to do that based on um, the work by uh, a linguist and a rhetorician from an article called The Science of Scientific Writing, which is great advice if you're writing um, in, the scientific, in one of the scientific disciplines, but is also great advice if you're not. So it's really um, Gopin and Swan talk about how to make your writing clear by using what reader, by um, thinking about what readers expect from your writing. So here's the paragraph um, from their uh, piece. Information is interpreted more easily and more uniformly if it's placed where most readers expect to find it. Right? The same logic of put your shoes where they belong every night so you can find them in the morning when you're in a rush. Right? Um, we expect, we find things most easily when they're where we expect to find them. Readers have relatively fixed expectations about where in the structure of prose they will encounter particular items of substance. If writers can become consciously aware of these locations, they can better control the degree of recognition and emphasis a reader will give to, to various pieces of information being presented. Good writers are intuitively aware of these expectations. That's why their prose has what we call shape. And if I were to change one thing, it would be that not good writers aren't intuitively aware, but they've developed that intuitive awareness, right? Um, and so Gopin and Swan talk about the kind of linguistic expectations um, in English. So uh, other languages have different expectations, but here they are in English. And actually, I've just talked about, I'm going to talk about three that they talk, that they discuss about how you can um, write to, help to uh, follow your reader's expectations. So the first is readers in English, readers expect a grammatical subject to be followed immediately by the verb. Think about those, sim those of you who were, are native speakers and learned to read in English, the simple sentences, the dog walked, Bob and to ran, right, subject followed immediately by the verb. We start getting in trouble when we separate the subject and the verb, right? If I say, yesterday I, on my way home on the, in the car with four children during a long drive across the Bay Bridge while I was hungry and someone in the background was crying, and you're like, what is happening? And we do that in fiction to create a sense of tension, and that's great, and you do it in storytelling all the time. But you don't necessarily want to do that in academic writing, right? In academic writing, you want things to be clear because the concepts are pretty complicated, right? So the story of my drive back yesterday from the Eastern Shore is not that complicated, um, but the story of whatever you're doing in your research is far more complicated, right? So again, these aren't rules, and there are always times when we do flaunt or we do um, disturb people's expectations for very good reasons, right? Well, we do, in fact, in academic writing create some kind of tension or not um, not answer the, not put the subject and the verb together immediately. But for the most part, for clarity, we want to put the subject and the verb together immediately. So this is a paragraph from um, uh, a former Maryland professor in education, June Ahn. This is about um, policy, technology, and practice in cyber charter schools. So here's a paragraph, and I'm guessing even if you're not in education, you have no problem following this paragraph. From a pedagogical perspective, cyber schools might introduce new ways of delivering education. For example, students may learn at their own pace and outside of the constraints of traditional school hours. Furthermore, the history of evidence on student achievement in distance learning suggests that online schooling, online schooling applications perform no worse when compared to classroom instruction. 
Although the authors of the meta-analysis found no significant differences between distance education and classroom instruction in terms of learning gains or losses, there are numerous benefits of cyber schools from a policy perspective. Cyber charters may be able to offer an educational quality comparable to that of traditional schools, but also reach underserved populations that need a more flexible educational option. For example, recent media reports have highlighted how students are using cyber schools to finish their high school credits. Relatively easy to understand. Uh, and part of that's because um, Professor On follows this rule of his subject is followed immediately by his verb. So there are the, I don't know how well you can see that. The subjects are in green and the verbs are in purple, and they're almost always right next to each other, right? From a pedagogical perspective, cyber schools might introduce, for example, students may learn. Furthermore, and we can see that sometimes the subjects are pretty long, right? They have long noun phrases, and that's really common in academic writing, right? That our subjects are these really long noun phrases, like the history of evidence on student achievement and distance learning. That's a pretty long noun phrase, right? But the fact that the verb is right there helps, right? Because if it was, uh, if he separated those, it would be even harder to, uh, to follow those. Um, there, um, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. Well, so it's often, it is, right? And so, um, I mean, this one, in this paragraph, it's not, um, except in that, where we see, right, where it says cyber charters may be able to offer, right? So it often is, and, and I'm glad you brought that up, right? So we see, it's not always, but it's, what comes before is usually fairly brief, right? And it's, it's the transition and connections, right? So from a pedagogical perspective, subject verb, right? For example, subject verb. Furthermore, subject verb. Um, although, subject verb. So, um, so it doesn't have to be, and again, it's not a rule, right? So you, it is that we expect them first, um, and when they're not first, it's usually because we're putting some kind of connective tissue in place, right? And that's what we see here, definitely, right? For example, although, what else am I saying? Furthermore, right, but I'm glad you asked that. That's a good question. Um, all right, let's go to the second one. The second one is even simpler. Readers expect a unit of discourse to serve a single function and make a single point. Right? And we forget that because when we're writing, we have so many things to say and you push it all in there, right? So if anybody's ever told you your sentences are too long, your paragraphs are, you know, three pages long, a single unit of discourse. And that's complicated, right? Because a unit of discourse is a phrase or a sentence or a paragraph or a whole paper or a whole dissertation, theoretically, right? Should have a single focus. Um, and, they, and obviously, we have lots of foci making up a bigger point, right? Um, but that idea that we should, if, if there are too many ideas in one unit of discourse, that becomes a more, more of a challenge for readers to, uh, to understand. And so here's, the, um, here's another paragraph from uh, the same article. Um, this is right after a heading. Uh, and you can see how even though it builds on, it develops a point, it's always the same point, right? Cyber schools within the broader charter landscape. The terms used to describe online education are varied and often confusing. Rice noted that distance education, distance learning, e-learning, web-based instruction, virtual schools, and online terms, online learning are all terms used interchangeably to describe this broad, somewhat confusing, and constantly changing field of non-traditional instruction. Other terms include virtual education, cyber schools, and e-schools. In this article, I used the terms cyber, online, and virtual schools interchangeably to mean the public and private institutions that deliver instructions using the internet. In the K-12 setting, there are different types of virtual schools spanning from state-level programs to individual charter schools, as Table 1 shows, cyber charters are just one form of online school among several that currently serve students in the K-12 system. So he's developing a point, but the bigger point is to define that term, right? What is the term that I'm using? The terms used, right, that we use a lot of terms. Here they are. Here's the one I'm using, right? So each sentence contributes something, and the bigger point is lots of terms. Here's the one I'm using, right? So you can see how that works. And then the last one, and this is my last point, um, is in some ways the most complicated one, and yet um, very useful. We expect, readers expect the information, new information, right, information to be emphasized comes at the ends of units, right? The end of a sentence, right, that we build up to a new point. The end of a paragraph, if you ever learn to like put your main idea at the end, right, or to put your, your big new idea at the end of a paragraph. Um, we expect new information at the end, and we expect the beginnings of sentences to be a kind of link back to things, right?
right? So the beginning of a sentence, readers expect topic positions to offer linkages, looking back, and then context too, right? So the beginning of a sentence helps us ground what we're uh, readers, and then the new information comes at the end. And this is actually referred to in linguistics as the known new contract, right? We start with what's known, and then we build on what's new. And here's one more paragraph. This is actually the first paragraph from that article. Um, Over the past two decades, the growing charter school movement and widespread adoption of the internet has brought about a unique confluence of policies and technologies in education. The result of this convergence is a relatively new form of public school, the cyber charter school, which offers both new possibilities for the delivery of education and rise in controversies that put pressure on existing education policies. A CCS is a public institution that is guided by a charter and offers a tuition-free education option. Virtual charter schools are unique because they deliver education programs over the internet. Cyber charters arise from the serendipitous combination of school choice policies and the widespread adoption of technology. And if we look at how that's, those sentences are put together, we can see that, right, so over the past two decades, there's the kind of um, positioning. But the, the main idea, right, the growing charter school movement and widespread adoption of the internet. Like, we kind of know those from the title and just from knowing things, right? We know that the adoption of the internet is growing, and we know that this is going to be about charters. And then the new information has brought a unique confluence of policies and technologies in education. And then we see what happens in the next sentence is that what's in green there, the new information from one sentence, becomes familiar and known information in the next one, right? So the result of this convergence, right, is now is part of that, uh, is connected to what came before, right? It's the connection. It's, the, it's now known. It was new at the end, and now it's become known, and then we get new information in the rest of the sentence. And we see that that happens throughout the paragraph, right? So then what's in green here becomes, he's talking about the CCS, the Cyber Charter School, giving us details about it. The next sentence starts with, well, a CCS, that's now familiar information. And then we get new information at the end of that sentence, and then the next sentence again, Cyber Charters, repeats that known information and gives us new information. So that's a way to help create connection throughout a paragraph. Um, it's actually even a good heuristic for creating a paragraph. Like if you're stuck and you think, okay, I have my main top, my, you know, my first sentence, how do I start to build on that? Like if you're stuck, it's actually a good like, okay, here's what I know, here's one piece of information, here's the new thing I'm adding. Now that's my connection. Now what am I adding? What am I adding? What am I adding? That's a way to, again, feed into reader expectations. We expect it gets what's known and then what's new. And I lied, and there's one last, less dramatic one. And that's the, another thing that we often um, also help our readers by giving them some kind of meta discourse, right? Talk about the talk. So things like over the past decades, or in this one, um, uh, the person asked, like, for example, furthermore, those kinds of things count as meta discourse, right? They're the kind of connections um, that help us, help readers follow things. And um, those of you that write in fields that have headings and subheadings, that's a kind of meta discourse, right? That's the kind of helping, uh, it's not content, it's about the content that's there. And it's helping your reader follow along. Usually the longer the text, the more meta discourse we get. Often the more complex the material, the more we want to kind of leave a way to explain how to read through it, whether that's through headings and subheadings or something else. It's common at the beginning and ends of subjects or uh, sections and chapters. It can be superfluous, right? It's probably things that you, someone along the line told you to get out of your writing, in my opinion. I would like to take this opportunity to blah, 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 blah. Those things that you don't necessarily need to say, but it can also be a guide. So you don't want to say those superfluous things, but you do want to say the, for example, furthermore, although, um, so that, that can help guide the reader. Um, and we actually see it. This is the more of the article, the um, interview article, where we can see the way that she used that in addressing the goals, in addition, finally, from this, in an effort, organized around, those kind of things that aren't part of the content but help us understand and follow the information. Questions about any of that?
Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started on the library research portion. Um, so you may think this is a little bit out of order, right? Writing goes first, and then you look at look for resources. Um, but the writing portion and the research portion are so interrelated that every time we do this, we're like, hmm, so who should go first today? Should you go first? Should I go first? Um, so the point is, is that you're frequently writing while you're researching and researching while you're writing. Um, so you have to kind of keep both in the back of your mind while you're, you're doing this exercise. Um, so I am Kelsey Corlett Rivera. I'm the head of the Research Commons. So I organize a lot of programming and services for graduate students and faculty around campus. Um, so I'm going to point out a few of our library resources that are specific to graduate students um, and some of your most important resources before we get into doing some searches and seeing how to um, really make sure that your searching is comprehensive when you're working on a literature review, okay? So this is the library homepage. It's lib.umd.edu. This is a great place to start your research if you aren't already doing so. Um, so if you are one of those um, people who are still in a book field, they do still exist. We have many books. You probably saw some on your way in today. Um, the best place to get started is with this search box on the homepage. This takes you into WorldCat, which is our catalog, but also will link you to materials at other institutions that we can then request. Um, you'll also notice this tab right here that says databases. Um, so this is the place to access most of our online resources, like journal articles that are included in various subject-specific databases. Okay. So if you already know your favorite, um, say like Psych Info, my personal favorite is the MLA International Bibliography. Um, I'm a foreign language literature scholar. Uh, so if you have a favorite database, um, you can type the title in right there, or you can browse by subject, browse by subject category. So you have access to all of this material from home, off campus. Um, once you get into the list of databases, um, let's say we're working on public health today. Apparently public health does not show up. I should have thought of that before I stood up in front of a group. Um, let's say animal science for the fun of things. Um, when you click this title right here to get into the Agricola database, if you are off campus, it will ask you to log in with your directory ID and password. Okay, So that's how that works. Otherwise, your um, functionality will be the same as if you were sitting right here in this room today. OK, um, so those are some very basic things. Um, I also want to emphasize some of our human resources, right? We have a large number of services, but we have some very um, helpful humans that work in the library as well. So you'll find them all over um, the first floor. Anytime you have a question, you could head to the library services desk. Um, the folks there can get you in touch with the resources that you need. They're open all the time, right? We're 24-7 we're for a significant portion of the semester. We also have subject librarians who are much more familiar with your particular discipline, and especially if you're working on a dissertation, master's thesis, some sort of large um, writing project, research project, I highly recommend scheduling a consultation with them. Um, so the best way to get in touch with one of them, um, if you, you can actually find them in a multitude of ways, but if you are looking for help, you can meet your subject specialist. And this gives you a little bit of information about the type of help that they can provide, and then you can get into our directory. So um, you can look by your subject. Um, so if you're in aerospace engineering, my colleague Elizabeth Sorgel is your librarian. If you click on her name, you can see her lovely face. Helps you recognize her if you're scheduling a meeting with her. Um, gives you a little bit more information about her, and then all of us now have this schedule a consultation button. So you can go ahead and click that button, and Op pups a live schedule with her availability in there. So you can see exactly when she would be available to meet with you, book an appointment online, meet her at her office over in the Engineering and Physical Sciences Library. Okay, So it's really easy to book an appointment with us. Um, I'm in here for foreign languages, if that's your field. And I highly recommend getting in touch with your librarian at some point. It can really help you make sure you're, you're looking in the appropriate places and being as comprehensive as you need to be, OK? So um, you can find that under Help, also under About, um, or on the Research Commons page. Um, so most of you, if you go under IMA on the drop-down menu, these menus are a little touchy. I know I'm going to get it. There we go. 
Um, if you click on I am a researcher, you end up on the Research Commons homepage, okay? And here you can see some of the services that I've mentioned, the spaces that are available to you, the subject specialist, and then also events like the one you're attending today. Okay, so this is a great place to go for um, library information and then also the events that are taking place here that are specific to researchers on campus. Okay, does anybody have any questions about the library homepage, some of our services, anything like that? There is a handout in the back that has um, some great information about how to request our materials and also some pro tips for getting your requests through as quickly as possible, okay? So definitely grab one of those if you haven't yet, um, and there's some links on there that will help you get to the places you need to be, okay? All right, so um, you guys are all here for literature review purposes, right? Um, Linda has given you a very good overview of why we do literature reviews, how you can structure them, how you can organize them, but you do have to have the actual literature at the base of them, right? Um, so since you all are from so many different disciplines, we're gonna stick with Google Scholar for today as opposed to heading into PsycInfo or Agricola or some of the other databases that we just looked at. How many of you guys use Google Scholar on a regular basis? Excellent, it's a great resource. Um, how many of you have it set up so that it recognizes you as a University of Maryland person and will give you access? A couple, all right. Um, so I highly recommend creating a Google Scholar profile if you haven't yet. Um, you can verify yourself as being a UMD affiliate, put in all your information. Um, you're seeing my uh, publications right now. But the other thing that this will do for you is that it will give you current awareness services, right? So it'll help you keep up with new research that's coming out around your publications. You can also save searches in Google Scholar and then get notifications when new things pop up in those searches. Okay, so um, if we go to my Google Scholar page, um, my updates. So you can see these are a list of articles that have come out around my research interests. So I highly recommend going in and doing that. While you're at it, um, I believe it's over here under settings. You can choose your library links, okay? So once you're in Google Scholar, you can see that I am with the University of Maryland libraries and it will go ahead and link into our proxy server so you can get access to articles automatically with your direct gradient password, okay? So um, we're heading back to Google Scholar. This is the home page. Um, so I also have up over here in a different tab, Zotero. How many of you have heard of Zotero? Just a few, okay. So Zotero is a citation management system, um, similar to EndNote, EndNote Web, um, Mendeley, or some others you may have heard of. There's another handout in the back that offers sort of a comparison of these different systems. Um, I'm a diehard Zotero fan. It's open source, you can keep it forever, you don't have to worry about it being tied to your institution. Um, it's got pretty much every style that you could ever want it to for any journal out there, um, since people are out developing the styles uh, as we speak. Um, and also keeps it up to date when say a new issue of a particular style manual is published. So um, I'm keeping Zotero open because it's really useful to have it while you are looking for your articles so you can keep things organized. So before I even start doing any searching, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new folder for today. And we're gonna say this is my, actually I'm gonna call it something else. This is gonna be my health informatics lit review. Okay, so I have a new folder. I don't haven't put anything in it yet. Um, and I realize that Zotero has just magically appeared on my machine. Um, but I'll take a little bit of time at the end if we have any and I can walk people through. It's very specific to your um, machine, whether you have a Mac or Windows or you're working in Firefox or you're using the standalone version. Um, so I won't try and troubleshoot for the entire group at once. Okay, so we're back to Google Scholar. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to work on health informatics today, all right? Um, so this is a pretty general search. Um, if I were really doing my lit review, I'd have a nice solid research question that I would be basing this on. 
Um, but for now, it's a broad topic of health informatics, and I'm seeing what's out there. Okay, so I'm going to do my search. Of course, I get a million results because it's Google, right? Um, so we're not going to look at all million today. Um, you can see that a lot of the full text versions are over here on the right, but you also see this little find at UMD link that pops up. So that's the bit that we'll look through our databases and see if we have access to the full text of this. Um, so yeah, so you see it showing up at a few different places. You may notice that some of these um, .edu addresses are the preprint version of the article, and we may be able to get you access to the post-publication version through our databases. So um, for the purposes of our project today, we're going to take a look at the first one. This is an article called Consumer Health Informatics. Oh, okay. So it was published in the British Medical Journal in 2000. We have the abstract right here. But we're running into a problem. It doesn't show the full text right here. Um, and it wants you to pay for it. Should you ever pay for an article? No. Good job. All right. That is part of the reason why the library exists, right? Um, we spend an awful lot of money on subscriptions to journals so that our researchers have access to their content, okay? So if you ever run into a screen like this where it says, oh, you have to sign in, you have to do this, you have to pay $75, you don't have to do that, okay? So we're going to backtrack because we don't want to do that. And we're going to try this link over here. Um, if it were, you know, find at UMB, we'd do that instead. And we will make sure... Okay, so we now have full text access um, through a different venue, okay? So my point is never pay for an article. And if you're really having a hard time tracking down something, email your subject librarian and say, look, I can't find this. So um, there's always a better way. Okay, so we have this article. Um, so we're going to say that this is a seminal article in our field, all right? So this is one article that we absolutely know we need to include in our literature review. So... We want to see where it got its information from, okay? So the sources that it has cited, so going back in the past. But we'd also like to see the sources that it that have cited this paper since it came out, right? So taking our little time machine and going forward. It was published in 2000. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of progress has been made on health informatics since 2000, okay? So the first step is going back in the past. And that's pretty straightforward, right? So we... Scroll down to the end of our article, and we take a look at the citations that have been included there, okay? So whenever you find a really solid article, one way to ensure that you're being comprehensive is to follow up on the sources that have been cited therein. So I chose somewhat randomly for the purposes of today's demonstration, but let's say that we're looking for this article by A. Coulter. Paternalism or partnership? Patients have grown up and there's no going back. I'm going to copy the title and the author. At some point, I'm very hopeful that all of these will just be magically linked from every bibliography that exists in the world. But until then, we still have to do a little bit of searching to get to the full text, all right? So I'll go ahead and copy that. I'm going to head back to Google Scholar, and I'm going to do a search for this one, okay? There we are. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and um, show you guys how the find at UMD works. So if we click this link, okay, it's going to let us know the ways that we can access the full text. So right here we say we have two different options that are in the British Medical Journal. Um, one is from the publisher website. The other is from JSTOR. Either of them will get you the full text, right? So you click this link right here. If we were off campus, we'd log in with our director ID and password. And here we have the full article, okay? So we have the full text version on this side, or we could click and get the PDF. All right, so we're working on our lit review. We followed up in the past. I want to make sure that I add this to my Zotero. So I have this lovely little icon up here in the toolbar that looks like a little page. I'm going to go ahead and save this. It tells me it's saving to my Health Informatic Lit Review folder. So if we go over here, 
Okay, so we now have the article with all of the citation information and actually the full text PDF right there, all right? So as you're doing your searching, you can store your PDFs, keep track of things. You can also add notes. So if we want to say, uh, where's the article? Right. This is, so this is, a, this is a British article. I mean, I know it's the British Medical Journal, but it's about the NHS, um, which is specific to Britain. So maybe we could say something like, uh, the British perspective. And all of these notes become searchable. Okay, so you can, if you remember that you, you said British perspective at some point, you could search for it and then find that article that way as well. Um, so I will go ahead and go back over here to info, okay? All right, so we have all the information that we need to get back to that. Um, I am going to go ahead and go back to our original search. Do, do, do. So this is our original source. Um, we said that we also wanted to go forward in time, right? So we want to see all of the things that have cited this particular source. Now Google Scholar very helpfully includes this cited by link. Other databases do as well. So keep an eye out for something like cited by, um, anything that sounds like that, and you can see the, the sources that have then cited this one that we're looking at at the moment. I feel like I always butcher the way that I say this because I'm talking in both directions, but hopefully you guys are staying with me when we're going forward and backward. Okay, so this is everything that has cited that particular article. Now our point in looking forward in the future from our original source was to see more recent things. So I kind of want to get rid of these 2002 results over here. So I'm going to go ahead and limit to since 2015. Um, we're getting a little bit further into 2016 that might do the trick. Um, so this is everything that cited that article since 2015. And I'm going to go ahead and take a look at this one about consumer health informatics. We'll take a quick look at it. Ha. So first of all, we're not going to buy the chapter. Um, what is this that I'm looking at? So it looks like a textbook, right? So this particular part right here, Consumer Health Informatics, is a chapter within that book. So this is a chapter of an ebook. Looks very much like your standard journal article. When you click on it, you figure out what it is that you're dealing with. So I point this out because it may inform what you want to get, right? Because it could be that you just need this little chapter, in which case you can um, submit a request for a single chapter or maybe you really do want the full clinical informatics study guide and you could request the entire book, okay? So it depends on, on you want to sort of think through what would be useful for you. Of course, getting a single chapter is going to be faster than if you were to request an entire copy of the book, okay? And I realized that I sort of jumped forward a little bit because I said request. So in this case, there was no find it option. Right. Um, if we go back and look over here, we didn't have any way to get access to this through the university. Um, so that means that we would go ahead and submit an interlibrary loan request. So how many of you have requested something from interlibrary loan? Just a few. Okay, I highly recommend it, guys. It's free. You get uh, scanned versions of book chapters and articles within three business days. Um, you can, if you're getting something that's from another um, Big Ten institution, you can get a full book in about a week and keep it for four months. So definitely take advantage of that resource. Um, so I'll show you sort of how to get there for this. Um, I, of course, already requested this for, from Interlibrary Loan so we could show you how it works. But right here on the, the home page, you can go to Interlibrary Loan and you borrow. You can see our different options for getting to things. In this case, I'm going to choose Classic Interlibrary Loan. It makes you log in with your, well, it tells you a little bit about it. We have about 47 links between the home page and actually logging into your ILL account. Sorry about that. So Classic Interlibrary Loan asks you to log in with your director ID and password. You can request an article or other copy. And then in two to three business days, you get an email that says, lo and behold, your article is here. So I requested this on Friday afternoon 
and I got it hours later, right? So my two to three business days doesn't all it doesn't always take that long. So I have all the information about what I requested. I have two weeks from today to download it. And of course, I just lost that page. Let's see if I can remember my password in front of a large group. Success. Okay. So now I have a PDF of this particular chapter. Okay. So I'm going to download it because I want to put it into my Zotero. Okay. So we have our little. Where I want, sorry. There it is. Okay. So that's the chapter that we're looking at. I'm going to add it to my Zotero. It's going to tell me that there's no full text PDF available. So when I go over here to Zotero, minimize that. There's the book chapter that we're looking at. I can add an attachment. And I will go ahead and grab that PDF that I just downloaded. Okay, so now I have everything in one place again. I don't have to remember to go back to my ILL account. I don't have to worry about, you know, not going in there for two weeks and then the file having disappeared. I keep it all together in one spot, okay? So we went back in time, we went forward in time, and we kept track of everything in Zotero while we were doing it, okay? Um, so the question is, well, now what do we do with all this stuff, right? Like, it's great to have an ongoing bibliography. It's great to have all your research in one place. You can see I have about a gajillion different folders here on the left, including all of my stuff from back in grad school. Um, so it's really great to have that historical record of what you've been working on. You don't have to recreate searches. You don't have to think, hmm, what database was I in when I found that particular article? It's all just in one place. And then when you're doing your writing, and you're going through and you're saying, this is the best lit review ever, clearly. And we say, OK, um, our first paper uh, touches on paternalism. And we want to cite that. So I've already installed the Zotero plugin for this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add a citation for it. We're going to say we're using APA for today. You can leave everything else defaults. And I remember that it was by that Coulter person. Uh -huh. um, it pulls in for the parenthetical citation. If you click on it, you can actually put the page number where you found your quote. So this will be 76, I've decided. You hit enter, and now you have a parenthetical citation. Okay. It also works with footnotes. Um, and then when you get all done and you want to finish your bibliography, you say insert bibliography, and it does the citation for you of whatever you've cited so far in the paper. Yes. Ah, it does, okay, so if you're using LaTeX, it does work. Um, and this is one of the advantages of using a, an open source platform that people are always adding to is that they, they make accommodations for systems like LaTeX. So if you Google, I, I Google a lot. My brains love Google. Um, so and Zotero, right. So it will explain how you can set all that stuff up. Um, so the other great thing is, let's say that you're writing for a particular journal, and you've used that style, and then bummer, you don't get your article accepted, and you have to resubmit to a different journal that, say, uses Chicago. Um, rather than tearing your hair out, you can change your style. I'm actually going to change to the full note version. And let's say your journal says end notes. Ah, we'll do this. It just does it. So it saves you time in the long run as well, all right? So whether you end up choosing Zotero or Mendeley or Papers or whatever it is that, that works for you, you know, if you're in Web of Science 24-7, then maybe you want to think about EndNote. Um, they interface very well together. Um, but you want to use something um, because it keeps everything in one place. You can write notes. You can stay organized. And that means that when you're working on your literature review and you need to know which study 
you know, use this type of methodology and organize it that way. You have all of that information right there in Zotero. You've used your notes, um, and it really is a great way to stay organized and to do proper citations at the end of it.